Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Great pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. My role here is to um, talk about a much talk talked about phenomenon, the millennial generation, the first generation of uh, consumers to come of age in this millennium. Now, they're, uh, as I say, very well talked about. But what I want to do is challenge some of the commonly held assumptions that we have uh, about this group of consumers and how they're going to evolve in the future. Because our work suggests that there are some pretty um, inaccurate misconceptions uh, about who they are and, and, and how they behave. So in doing that, I want to set the scene for how the generation is going to evolve and what's going to come. Obviously, explore some of the commercial implications for you guys, and hopefully have some fun along the way, because I do have some audience participation, voting type, quizzy type questions. I have to confess, I don't know if there's a prize for my lot, but if there isn't one, I'm sure Trajectory will can, can stump up some charts or something by way of a, by way of a, uh, yeah, don't all rush at once. Um, <coughs> So just a little bit of background um, to the business. It's a business I set up with some colleagues four years ago. I've been um, spent most of my career working in monitoring, understanding, forecasting trends in consumer behaviour using a wide range of uh, research techniques. Uh, and it's a lot of that information that I want to bring, uh, bring to bear uh, this morning, working with clients from a wide range of sectors uh, all over the world, including the, the travel, retail and tech and agency sectors that are obviously very well represented uh, in the audience uh, today. And for those clients, I say we've looked in depth, not just at uh, groups of consumers in the UK and Europe, but um, across uh, the whole uh, of the globe. And one of the key ways in which we do that is um, we're monitoring consumer trends. We're running our own consumer trends surveys about eight times a year in 20 countries. And it's some of that, the European element of that uh, data that I'll share with you um, in, the, in the form of some quiz questions and see uh, if you, how well you understand the mood of, uh, of the modern consumers. So that's the kind of flavor of the, of the uh, participation questions that you're, you're going you're gonna to get from us. One of the things that I think makes our work distinctive from a, a range of people who uh, and competitors of ours who look at trends is the way that we really try and get under the skin of consumer behavior and look at real fundamental values and ask some quite, well, on the face of it, might be quite unfashionable questions about attitudes to gender relationships, religion, uh, freedom and control in people's lives. Um, but actually, we really think that gets to the heart of, of a lot of the behaviors that you, you'll see in your marketplace in terms of how people engage with your brands in, diff in different platforms. It's, it's a lot of those fundamental drivers. And again, a, a, another key element, of course, is the economics. Now, we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time in my presentation this morning looking at the, uh, the impact of the economic situation on this group and future groups of consumers. So on to the uh, main body. Uh, of, of my presentation. As I say, I think the millennials, um, uh, who come under many other names, you can see there, Generation Y, I think, is probably the first one that was called, but the, mill the millennial generation, much talk about, but I think not terribly well understood uh, in the main. In fact, we can't even agree. You see the question mark there, you know, born between 1981 and 2000, perhaps. Actually, there's no agreement as to when, you know, when, the, generation, when the generation ends. Um, a lot of this analysis on generations actually stems from the states, so actually, the, and it is obviously linked to events in the states, so Generation X, Generation Y, and so on. Um, so I think that explains why, you know, sometimes the definitions of the boundaries aren't so clear-cut when it comes to a European context. I think some people would have you believe that the generation was cut off was 1995 with the evolution of the World Wide Web, but for this morning's purposes, let's assume we're talking about that generation of people who are just 30 uh, and below, born between, um, born between 1981 um, and 2000. And they have been characterized as a group of consumers compared to previous generations with a very distinctive set of points of views um, and attitudes. And this, this, I think, this slide captures the initial view of this generation at the, perhaps at the turn of the millennium and the first few years of the millennium. It's quite a generous description, I think, in the main. They're not perfect, obviously, as a group, which, which generation is. But they were seen as being something of a reaction against my generation. I'm a generation Xer, 
uh, and that they were, you know, my generation is a bit quite cynical, uh, quite pragmatic, and just gets the job done. Whereas this lot were um, more caring and more idealistic, as well, of course, as being the first generation to come of age with a rapid evolution of digital technology and the World Wide Web and the, and the Internet and all that that brings. So tech-savvy, web-focused, uh, web um, hyper-connected, all those things, trusting, tolerant, a really, really um, lovely, lovely bunch. And this was the received wisdom about the millennials until really uh, quite, quite recently. So I want you to hold that thought in your minds about this is how we started to describe the millennials uh, whilst we pause for our first quiz question, if we, if we can do that. Excellent. So we just couldn't resist really with a, a, an audience uh, like this in front of us to test, first of all, to test your knowledge of, of millennials, talking about millennials, what about millenn millennial brands? And you see listed there four brands that could be said to be brands of this uh, this millennium have also, like consumers, come of age in this millennium. Yahoo, eBay, Amazon, and Google. And we want to know which is the youngest millennial brand. So which brand was born most recently? And if you'd like to start voting, so yeah, one for Yahoo, two for eBay, three for Amazon, four for Google. Very good, very good. And yeah, absolutely right. The 37% of you that, that, that Google is the young kid on the block, uh, born in 1998. eBay was 95 and Yahoo and Amazon both 1994. So well done to that 37% of you who got that, got that right. So the millennial generation, tolerant, caring, outward looking, obviously, uh, digital natives or very the older ones digital adopters um, that's where we that's where we left them I think now a very different view of this generation uh, is emerging emerging they used to be talked about as the most privileged generation in history and they've gone from that to this so certainly a generation that a lot um, a lot has happened to uh, you know, variously called the duty generation uh, here in the UK, uh, Generation Screwed, um, a news re in the US referred to them recently, and you can barely, a week goes by, that you don't see uh, a news report or a political debate or discussion talking in the UK uh, about the lost generation, and obviously echoes of that throughout Europe. Germany being something of, a, of an exception, actually, as we'll, as, as we'll talk about some of these issues of youth unemployment, much less um, acute uh, in Germany. And I guess... The kind of low point for the millennial generation here in the UK, you see the picture of the, one, one of the incidents in the London riots um, that happened uh, 13 months ago, a, a real low point, and seems a, a millennia away from that description of the privileged generation, outward looking, caring, uh, and, and, and so on. Again, I think there's been something of rehabilitation in recent months with the London 2012, and obviously a lot of the people who were the athletes and were the volunteers were of the millennial generation. And I think what I want to explore in the rest of the presentation is actually how both of these extreme characterizations of the millennial generation are exactly that, they're extreme characterizations, and the truth lies probably somewhere in between. And one of the key determinants, which I just want to introduce briefly now, is the economic context within which the millennial generation are, um, are operating and are consuming and engaging with you guys. The first, of course, is the overall nature of the economy. And, what, and it's why um, the extreme characterization, the extreme negative characterization, is probably wrong, because actually there's no one experience, it goes, probably goes out saying, of the economic downturn in the UK or anywhere else throughout Europe. Some people, if they have the right skills, if they're in the right job, the knowledge economy and so on, have actually sailed through um, the, uh, the downturn. Lots of jobs um, being created in the UK around trading with um, 
the emerging markets thus far, I mean, emerging markets might well be slowing down quite rapidly, but to this point, you know, jobs in manufacturing, in um, car production and so on have been created in the UK. So it's not a universally bad, bad story. The middle graphic there points to a piece of work we did for which um, magazine uh, in early in this year about um, actually how it's quite simplistic just to look at people's income levels and assume that their behaviour as consumers are going to be determined by their pure income levels. There are two other key dimensions to their behaviour. One, I think, is the financial habits that people took into the economic downturn with them. There were wealthy consumers who were mortgaged to the eyeballs, full of credit card debt, who were struggling in the current downturn, and simply there were poorer consumers who had always lived within their means, didn't take out any credit, who actually are chugging along okay, although at a much lower income level. And then there's the things that are always with us, the third dimension of this, which is life events. So again, wealthy consumers who've been exposed to divorce, maybe having children, so losing a, an income in the household for, year, for a, a, a few months at a time, a year at a time, those kinds of life events are shaping up. So it does bear a bit more thought uh, about you know, just a, a bit of, it takes a bit of work and a bit of targeting and a bit of segmentation to really understand where your consumer is and you can't just assume because they're on a certain income level that they've had a particularly good or a particularly bad generation. The other thing that's not uh, 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 recession, um, the other thing that's by no means obvious is, a, is the differential levels of consumer confidence within different groups of consumers. And here the millennials are incredibly striking because in all our research it shows that they're the most optimistic uh, of, of age groups. That it's the young adults who are the most confident about the economic prospects for the nation as a whole and about their, old, their um, own household economic prospects, which it might be surprising given all those stories you hear about the lost generation, the jilted generation, and so on. Now, I think there are obvious reasons for that, and the kind of those people who prefer psycholog psychological analysis to social research, I think, would, would absolutely get this, that young people tend to be optimistic. They've got the whole of their lives in front of them, and they've got time, whatever, however bad things are at the moment, they've got time to sort it out. And it's actually older consumers who are rather more, rather more pessimistic uh, than that. So it's, it's by no means obvious, um, you know, when you get under the skin of some of these phenomena uh, about how the millennial generation have been uh, identified. Now, clearly, one of the key defining characteristics other than that kind of economic social context of this generation is their technological repertoires, which are the most diverse of any group of consumers because they've had um, more opportunity, but certainly the appetite is there and everybody's seeing, you know, one of the things that is genuinely quite new about this generation is, is their apparent willingness to up, not just embrace new technologies, but constantly upgrade them on a, an 18 month cycle. Uh, which, if you think, you know, is, they're with the first generation of consumers uh, that, that have done this. And they're particularly um, embracing, and I know you're getting a lot of um, information about this later, uh, embracing uh, mobile telephony as well, and all our data uh, supports that. And that's, you know, the UK actually, uh, looking at some com ComScore data that was just released yesterday, is, is leading the way in terms of embracing that. So over 16% 16 of uh, all uh, internet traffic being on mobile or, ta or tablets in the UK, the, the, the European leader. So this generation have, you know, can really be defined by their um, embracing of technology. And yet, perhaps another slight paradox uh, about them is that that's not the only thing uh, that defines them. And, and um, their media uh, consumption is obviously still very diverse. And you can't really, there's a danger, I think, sometimes when talking about the manuals to get star starry-eyed about their engagement with new, the, with the latest media and the latest technologies and forget that actually they're still, largely because of their age, really avid users of traditional, um, traditional media. And I think there's a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater um, there uh, and, and getting too carried away. Um, you know, for, for many, for many millennials, their first introduction to a brand is still likely to be through TV. They're very avid cinema goers uh, in terms of where they get their advertising messages from. They're out and about, um, so they, they have great exposure to outdoor advertising and so on. And again, in this, just trying to create some balance, 
in, in the argument, we were struck by some research that has been, I think, well reported by Forrester looking at social media pa uh, participation, and they came up with this 99-1 ratio, 90%, 9%, 1 ratio, where um, 90% were the passive uh, observers in social media, the lurkers, as they're called, which always sounds a bit, bit furtive. Um, uh, so 90% are really passive observers. Then the 9% the are the kind of occasional participants, and the 1%, according to Forrester, are the really active uh, d uh, developers of content. And so I think that just puts it um, into, into context how occasionally um, this group can be quite conservative in um, in their interaction with, with media. I think one of the key issues that determines that, and I will re replay this with, and show you some data shortly, is, um, is trust and how much trust they have in the various uh, media. And with that in mind, the issue of trust, it's time for another quiz question. We can... Which is... In which of our countries that we're covering today, UK number one, France two, Germany three, Sweden four, in which country do millennials trust social media uh, comments and blogs the most? And if I could encourage you to start voting now, please. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, well, the 35% of you who said the UK can pat ourselves on the back because it's the UK where social media is trusted the most. Sweden actually is where social media is trusted the least. Um, so I think those prizes are in, uh, in jeopardy here. Um, so yeah, we've got 25% trust in the UK, 22% trust in France, 19% trusting in Germany, and 14% in Sweden. So, what strikes me though is, is that actually those levels of trust are relatively low, and low compared to other media. Now, on the subject of prizes, uh, I am more than willing to. Um, that's not the. So I've gone back rather than forwards. I'm more than willing to offer a prize to anybody and tell me what on earth this chart means. Um, it, it was actually produced by a management consultancy. You probably guessed that, but we, we borrowed it for the day. Um, I don't, sorry, I don't mean to be, rude, but what, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a grain of truth in this, which I think is very interesting. And, and so bear in mind what I was saying about the media repertoires of the millennial generation. Um, I think it needs to, that needs to inform our understanding of, sh of shopper journeys and, and, and the way, uh, the, the many and various ways in which uh, this generation of consumers come to find out about your brands and come to engage with your brands. And uh, the reason for picking this sl slide out, rather than having a cheap shot at management consultants, was to think, who knows, it may, it may be right or may be wrong, but what it certainly points to is a greater degree of uh, complexity of reiteration in the consumer journey than the kind of traditional linear models of consumer journeys to, um, to the, to, to, in terms of engaging with, uh, with, uh, with products. And there's a couple of things that um, I'd, I'd like to point out. It certainly uh, highlights the, road, the role of word of mouth, which I think is, is a key thing going forward. And it's almost something I think in the last few years we've, we've forgotten about. Now, our gaze has been taken put off the, the, the role of word, word of mouth, whether that's direct, conversationally, or, or through social media and so on. And in particular, it struck me that the post-purchase um, post experience and the opportunities for evangelism among this group. Now, we, said, we said that they're outward going, they, they want to communicate. And so the way that these groups represent um, can be really powerful brand evangelists and brand, um, uh, and brand advocates. So I think one of the implications of that, and I have to say, confess straight off, I, I am no uh, media or co communications strategist, but it seems to us that the upshot of that rather complex slide is this rather more straightforward one, which is just simply calling for and acknowledging the role of these different elements in terms of communicating and that there, there is still, even today, for all the vast change, there is still a role 
for all of these elements in a, in a communication strategy aimed at, uh, even at the millennial generation. So traditional messaging, old-fashioned TV, cinema ads, whatever it might be, com two-way conversations through social and digital uh, media, and then also brand interaction, the experience, uh, the experience element, are all potentially incredibly powerful. Um, you know, so there's, even for the millennials, there's a role, uh, there's a role uh, for this. Um, changing tack slightly, we've got, we've got another uh, quiz question coming up. Because the, so the economic context is uh, in, in incredibly important, just as a, as a and I'm going to come on to that next, but just to sort of tee that up, I um, want to ask you, in which of our countries, you've probably got the, uh, got the gist of which is number one, which is number four by now, in which country are um, millennials most keen on finding the cheapest price? So which, in which country is their most price sensitivity? And if you'd like to vote now, please. Uh, you're getting into your groove. Yeah. Um, well, kind of actually. You're absolutely right with um, with the UK. 63% of UK e-commerce millennials um, are, are motivated by finding the cheapest price. 56% uh, in France. Um, the Germany perhaps were, were the lowest. So those of you who picked Germany were, were sort of backing the wrong horse. But actually, I think that reflects what you're going to see is that, that Germany's a bit of, in terms of the countries we're looking at here, Germany's a little bit of an outlier economically, that the millennials are not having such a tough time economically uh, in Germany as they are elsewhere. And I think that explains this, this economic context, as I say, that I want to turn to uh, right, right now. So I've gone backwards again. We seem to be going backwards after the uh, after voting, rather than forwards. Um, so c clearly, there has been um, a complete transformation in the economic prospects of of, the, of this group. And as the Yale School of Management were writing about um, recently. You know, there is a lot of debate about what the high levels of youth unemployment mean around Europe. There's a lot of academic debate around the, the, the figures and the way that they're reported. But that aside, I do think you know, that the Yale School of Management have it right when they say that getting, you know, coming of age in this context with low growth and possibly without a job does have large negative and persistent echoes down uh, the, the life cycle uh, for, for, this, for this generation. So. It has transformed them, and so, for, you know, for example, what we're echoing here is you can see um, the millennials' attitudes towards ethical consumption and the environment morphing as we go through the economic downturn, and they still might engage in um, green consumption, but it's much more selfish and much more about saving, pro saving money than about saving the planet, Health a reference to you know, the upside of global warming, and uh, it means there's more. Uh, uh, life card. So what I would challenge is this kind of notion, we've had it in Britain, that um, the, the, it's, it's taking it too far. I think there will be long and permanent consequences of the downturn for, for the behaviour of these consumers, and they will remain price conscious, they will remain cautious. But I think, it, again, it can be taken too far. And perhaps the best example of this was the, the uh, Ed Miliband talking about the broken British promise. Uh, last year, or is it earlier this year, and that this will be the first generation of Brits, and you could read the same for France, um, Italy, other European countries, this will be the first generation that are actually poorer than their parents' generation. He's got a bit of a point, they're going to struggle, but that's, t again, this tendency to extreme. We've done quite a bit of analysis on this, and our view is that by the time that, the, that this cohort of 50-something, the age that their parents are, they'll be 33% better off in real t economically. However, and that might sound fantastic, but what you've got to realize is that their parents are 100% better off than, the, the, than, the, than their, the grandparents of the millennials, if you see what I mean. So what you've got is this kind of slightly complicated phenomenon of a, gro of a slowing of a rate of growth in incomes for these, these people. It's not a decline in incomes that they're facing. It's just you know, a growth of about a third uh, that was experienced by um, uh, by the previous generation. And the reason for that is really quite simple, and you, you have it here. I don't know how, how well this comes across at the back, but um, just to point out, it's something that's 
not said explicitly, um, not only is the current downturn pretty deep and just about as deep as the Great Depression, it's actually going on for much, much longer. You know, by this point in the cycle, so this is just looking at the number of months from the start of the various big economic downturns. But this is London, this is UK, but there's a similar similar picture in Europe. Germany being something of an exception. I, I, I keep I should keep stressing. Um, so by this time uh, in the Great Depression, it was all over. They were growing again, and we're still a long way. So when you get back to the horizontal line, when you get back to zero, that's the point at which the economy is back to the peak level before the recession started. We're still miles and miles away from that. It could well be, to, I'm not an economic forecaster, uh, and it amazes me the way economic forecasters have got through uh, this, I don't know if there are any in the room, that through, through this recession. Um, I mean, they're still forecasting, you know, perhaps 1% growth for next year, 2% growth for the year after. I'm not sure where that's coming from, to be honest. I don't want to be too pessimistic. It's all, in all likelihood it'll be 2015, 2016, before that red line gets back to the zero in the UK. So talk about virtually a lost, given the downturn started at the end of 2007, a virtually lost decade for the uh, British economy is, uh, is a reality. So with that cheery note in mind, <laughs> shall, we have a, shall we have another vote? Because one of the key issues is how you react to that and whether you let it get you down. And, and, and so there's no one experience out there. Some consumers have sailed through this recession completely unscathed and done, and, done, and done very well for those reasons I was rehearsing earlier. But one session there, in which country, so we've got another vote, in which country are, the, are millennials most optimistic about their national economy? Who's got the most optimism out there? And if you would start to vote now, please. <laughs> Not bad, not bad. I like, I like, it's really good fun knowing something that other people don't know, I don't. <laughs> Doesn't happen to me very often. Um, yeah, in fact, it's Sweden. 29% uh, in Sweden. Germ Germany is next with 24%, with France 14 in the UK, UK 20. So, so not, not bad, I think you're getting into your stride now. Um, but to just to say, I mean, again, those levels are really quite low. Um, they're the most optimistic of any age group, by the way. And if you look at other age groups, they're, they're even, even less optimistic, but, so, but they, they're, they're, they're quite, quite low. So, to move on, um, and to pick up on what, uh, what Dan mentioned in his, his introduction, we are seeing the perfect storm for advertisers and brands. Um, you know, the confluence of economic turmoil that you, you've seen there, mass adoption of new consumer technologies and the resulting uh, consumer empowerment, which I think is, is incredibly real and incredibly genuine. Um, you know, we don't do quantitative research in the core work that we do. You know, you do feel, feel amongst this generation that you know, finding the right brand and the right product at the right price is a badge of honour for the millennial. And they'll celebrate and share their achievements. It is a real achievement through social media. Uh, and we, talk, we have a trend we talk about a lot of trajectory called mer mercurial consumption and the kind of end of brand loyalty and so on. And I think it, it really plays to that. And you see it incredibly strongly uh, in this, this group of, of, of consumers. Um, a, a kind of another sort of manifestation of that is, is illustrated here. For years, people doing my kind of job have talked about conspicuous consumption and we're we moving away from conspicuous consumption to inconspicuous consumption and all that sort of thing. So pe and I, I just think that that debate is completely moribund and, and is, is on the verge of being silly, if I may offer such a strong opinion. Uh, because actually, I think there's some eternal... The more I look at consumer trends and change, the more... Often what strikes me most is how things stay the same rather than how things change. And one of the things, the eternal truths about consumer behaviour is that whatever you buy... Uh, 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 brands or, or not brands, one of, the, one of the motivators is what that says about you, your, your ability to demonstrate your taste, your values, um, and it can play out in all sorts of ways. And I think what we see over time is not um, conspicuous consumption turning into inconspicuous consumption becoming conspicuous consumption again, as some people would have it. It's just the evolution of what conspicuous consumption means, and that links to the times, and I think the economic times that we 
are going through and the technologically disruptive times that we're going through are changing what it, the nature of conspicuous consumption from being about what you earn and it being purely about being able to flash the cash into being a bit more discerning. So showing that you understand you've got some level of knowledge, uh, social capital as the French um, the, the uh, cultural capital, as a French sociologist would, would, would have it. And from flair to being, being a bit more caring, thoughtlessness, thoughtless benefits to being in the, in the know, and from you know, wealth to being much more kind of about well, well-being and, and health. And we've, and we've circulated in the know there, because I think particularly for this generation, it's a critical factor, being the insider, being the one that knew first and that, and that could share about it. That's an incredibly uh, aspirational uh, that I mentioned to uh, millennials' behaviour. There are also many others emerging from the, um, this economic context. And actually, in the interest of time, I, I, I'll, I, I'll skip over this a little bit. But this, you know, you can see money following a lot of these things. The cocooning, lots of lots of uh, money being spent in, in home, an interest in DIY and the processes by way by, by how things are developed. Selfishly green, I. I, I I mentioned. I think you often find millennials at the heart of the alternative economy, trading, uh, you know, rather than rather than buying, uh, and, and various other trends that emerge uh, emerge out of this. And one thing that I really want to uh, stress um, in terms of the role of, of of technology in the in the consumption process is that there are still some barriers that exist even for this group, even for the generation that um, are ma mainly digital na natives, some of the older ones be uh, adopters, but mainly digital natives, they still do have some barriers. There's more that they would do in terms of engaging and trading uh, and buying using uh, new technology. Uh, apart from, and it's particularly these concerns around privacy and, con uh, and security. And again, I think there's a, a danger of assuming that these, these guys are just so comfortable with, with the technology and using the technology in every way, that you sometimes forget that actually there, there might well be uh, anxiety, particularly about being ripped off in terms of privacy and concerns, because the money, money is really tight, and that goes across, across Europe. I've just picked out UK and Germany here. But those, those who, uh, we ask questions about all the things that might hold people back in terms of using new, uh, new uh, technologies um, and new media. And it, it's, it's the, it, the ones that remain uh, longest of the, of the security concerns. Now, I'm not an expert in big data. I'm really not, so please ask me any questions about it. But I think it would be wrong to, to have this kind of presentation without uh, an acknowledgement of big data, particularly what I've just said about data and privacy concerns, because clearly the, there's a huge amount of opportunity um, with transactional data and the data gathered by devices and so on to really get under the, under the consumer's um, skin and, um, f and find out much more about it. But the point here is, and, and the potential is, is clearly, clearly huge and we're, we're still kind of grappling with the, with, the, with the possibilities, but they will only be realised uh, if these issues of trust and concerns around privacy and, and security are addressed. Um, which tees me up for another, um, another quiz question about trust in businesses. And which countries millennials trust multinational businesses the most? Do you fancy having a, having a vote on that? Please go ahead. Very good. You really are getting into your stride, audience. Well done. Yeah, it's it's the um, the UK uh, is the most, followed by Sweden, France, and Germany. So yeah, pr pr pretty good. But again, quite quite um, quite low low levels. So I'm just really struck hearing that countdown music. Really marks me out down as a Generation Xer. You would never have mistaken me for a millennial, I'm sure. But I can remember where I was when Richard Whiteley died. So I think that's one of the definitions of being a uh, being a Generation Xer. Um, so I did start this presentation by saying, well, what, what comes next? And actually, of course, as things speed up, there's already um, a hankering and a desire to identify a new generation. If you're going to as I say, it goes back to the beginning, it's, it's not always clear cut about when one generation ends and a new generation starts. And our view actually would be it's a bit soon if you're being quite literal about it. Generation really ought to last 20 years, if not, if not 25, to say we've got a new generation 
on the way anyway. Um, so some people say perhaps if there's a new generation emerging from those who were born in 97, well, fortunately, this makes the maths easy for me, I've got a son who was born in 1997, which means they're 15 years old, uh, and so they're not really sort of fully formed as consumers yet. They are consumers, but not f fully formed. So, but I think it's quite easy, it's quite interesting to speculate what this new emerging group of consumers uh, might be like. We, we, we've become, and, and already people are trying to do, uh, trying to do that. the internet pioneers, the end generation, the plurals, the homelanders, a, a reference, that's a US one, reference to that actually it's not going to be technology that shapes this next generation of consumers, but actually the, 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 harking to the 9-11 experience. And that, that, that could be the defining characteristic, which I think is, a, is an interesting thought. And, you know, it's very rarely just one phenomena, what, either economic or otherwise, that defines a generation. It's usually several, and I think sort of throwing in that kind of context uh, is, quite, is quite interesting. We're favours of the, uh, we favour the, the Potter generation, or perhaps the Hogwarts, or, or something like that. We rather, uh, we rather like that. We, but I think it is too soon to describe um, so 17, 16, 17, 18 year olds as, as this generation, as a departure from the last generation. We'd see them as kind of late millennials, I think is probably the right, the, right, the, the, the very last dying days of the, of, of the uh, millennial generation before something else comes along. And we'd also argue that actually the defining themes of this generation, perhaps with those political, geopolitical issues aside, will be, will be similar. You know, this will genuinely be the first group um, that have grown up not having like any of them, not having any life without the internet, you know, not having known information scarcity, not like, you know, 10 years ago, being, des being on holiday, desperate to find out the, the uh, result of your football team's last match and not being able to find a, an English newspaper. So the thing is, it's my definition of, of data scarcity. They'll never know that. Which I think, I, see, I, make, I make a serious, serious point. I think that if, you, if you've never known data scar scarcity, it might affect how you value data and certainly your willingness uh, to pay for it um, if, it's, if it's seen as, uh, uh, as ubiquitous. We've got another quiz question for you now. We'll take a pause before going into the conclusions. And it's kind of going back to, um, uh, to the first question, which is, which is the oldest of these post-millennial brands? So they all, they all were founded uh, in this millennium. Uh, so which is the oldest this time? So um, it's actually which one was born first is the, is, the, uh, is the answer we want. So do you want to fancy having a vote, a vote on that? Interesting. Um, spectacularly wrong. Um, I don't, there's no other words. I'm sorry. I'd like to be kinder, but um, no, other, no other word for it. LinkedIn, uh, 2003, uh, is the oldest, followed by Facebook, 2004, YouTube, 2005, and Twitter, 2006. So, okay, I'm getting into wind-up mode now, um, as in the sense of ending rather than trying to irritate you. Um, um, just to be just to be clear, um, so you know what, what's coming next, and um, so some some key themes. I think this a lot of the, the material on this slide is driven by economic concerns, so greater risk aversion. Let, you know, I think this will be a generation that is less ke keen on taking out credit, for example, uh, and will live uh, something that means become a bit more German uh, in, in in that in that sense. Um, considered shoppers. Um, you know, expressive and sharing their, uh, sharing their experiences, be they good or bad. Uh, I think that, that's the key thing. This point um, about insanity, uh, it's not our phrase, somebody else coined that, but I wish we had done, uh, which I think is right. You know, this, is, although it's, this often mentioned when people talk about the microwave generation. Imagine what this generation get within the space of a minute that might have taken us, you know, uh, older, older of us, um, uh, rather, rather longer to... to um, to, to achieve and rental gratification maybe they don't need to to own so many things think about you know the spotify uh, generation and so on increasing focus on exclusivity and personalization offers for me um and that, that i think that will be a very strong theme emerging for this uh, generation because of what they've what they've been through um also the, the just flag the um, enhanced critique of the establishment um I think 
this generation will make it their business to make sure that those in charge don't have a quiet life. And I think that's going to be one of the key uh, generations. So that's the overall. So specific things around, um, around retail. Um, the consumer's role is, I think, is a brand champion. I think that that is something to, that is potentially really important to, to tap into the evangelist point um, that, that, um, that, I, that I made earlier. Seamless cross-channel platform integration. I know that's easier said than done, but I, I think it has to be um, the, the objective uh, for, for retailers. Total transparency. Uh, intre about everything, not just price, but actually interest in the process. I think, uh, for, for, for whatever reasons, maybe not because of you know that ethical impulse, but just a curiosity about how your products uh, get uh, get into into their into their hands. Um, other things just to pick out from this. Obviously, the central role of mobile and the kind of nuance. I think uh, we absolutely absolutely buy that. And again, I have not talked too much about mobile because I know you're going to get more of that uh, later in the day, but absolutely agree with the thrust of that, the, the, the year of mobile and the increasing role of mobile. Just one point on that, though, is that the focus of mobile as a, as a relationship management tool seems important to us. I think very often the emphasis is a bit too much on it as an advertising channel, but I think the keeping in touch uh, via mobile is, uh, is, in, uh, is really important. Just in terms of um, uh, the, the travel sector, um, in a nutshell, I think um, this, this is some work we're very proud of doing. We, we um, were asked to provide the United Nations World Tourism Organization with their long-term forecast for tourism volumes around the world. So this is the, producer, the, the work of my uh, economic, uh, econometrics team. And what it shows is for this generation, it's quite simply, there will be more of it. They're keen travelers, they're more curious, more adventurous a greater variety of generations, and what those charts illustrate actually is a decline in more, well, not, not an absolute decline, a relative decline in more traditional uh, destinations, less visits to the US, for example, but much more visits to um, emerging markets from uh, uh, 2015 um, and beyond. So holidays are hugely uh, important, and travel is hugely uh, important to these groups. So a, 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 I think a final quiz question from me, I think so, is which country's millennials take the m most short breaks? And do you want to have a, a vote on, on that? Ooh. Now, I should come clean here, actually. The, um, the differences between the countries is really quite small. Um, so, but actually, strictly speaking, the um, millennials that take the most short breaks per annum are the Swedes. Um, France is second place, UK in third, and Germany fourth. But the differences are very small. I think that we, we saved a very, hard, a, a very hard question to the end. So very briefly, I'm aware I'm, I'm, I'm overrunning slightly, so I'll quickly go through these um, last couple of slides. So <clears throat> in terms of the millennial generation, we think it's too early to speak of a new generation um, emerging uh, and better to understand the, the young end, the, the sort of teenage maturing end as, as, the, as the, the late uh, millennials. They face a challenging time and the outcome of the economic situation in Europe that's still very uncertain will be a big factor shaping their their lives. But what we can be sure about, as you'll hear more about later in the day, is that mobile will be at the heart of their lives and, and their engagement uh, with, with you guys and your, your brands. Um, I think that, that doesn't exclude the import and doesn't diminish the importance of retail experiences. Uh, and there will be, for the right ones, there will be um, a, lot of a, a, a lot of appeal and retailers, theatre, and, the, and the, those kinds of issues, I think, remain important. And in terms of, finally, the macroeconomic uh, conclusions, I think it's, it's really too early to anticipate a return, as so many economists are doing, to the long term. In the absence of anything else, they, they're moving to the default position of assuming a, a return to long, long term trends. Um, but having said that, what, rather than depress you, I hope the next point is helpful, that rather than assume a universal recession, there, there are, have been these very different experiences of recession within the millennial group, and there are people out there who, who do represent genuine opportunity uh, for you, particularly 
if you can get this investment, get the trust there in this investment in data analytics right, there's lots of uh, opportunities. Um, emerging markets, in incredibly uh, important. I think their relationships with, as employers, those of you who, you know, who have young people in your, your companies will change, actually. And this blurring of work, work and life has got to be something that, uh, uh, work and leisure life has got to be something that you need to be uh, aware of. And um, they are showing to be, and I'll end with this, rather unfortunate uh, of all the labels being at, um, banded about at the moment, um, showing themselves to be quite entrepreneurial. And to, to end on a slightly upbeat note, the, one of the things that the current environment is doing for this generation is taking some of the pressure off, allowing them to be a bit more adventurous, because definitions of success, actually the bar has been lowered in a, in a Europe where there's mass unemployment of young people. The bar to measure success has been lowered. Lots of people, uh, uh, this group has been well documented in the recent weeks, are actually starting their own businesses, which has led to naming them Generation E, which I think is, is rather unfortunate. Um, and on that, and on that note, I think I should probably, I think I should probably stop. Thank you very much indeed.